Welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is John Richardson and I work in
Good evening and welcome. I'm Francisco Gonima, and uh, you're here for the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee uh, content discussion. Uh, we are at our penultimate discussion of the series, and tonight we're talking about who's who, where, and when. Uh, so to start us off, uh, we're here at Mission San Jose, and we'd like a brief welcome from Christine Jacobs, Superintendent of the San Antonio Missions National Historical Park and Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee member. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Jacobs, and I'm honored to be the superintendent of San Antonio Missions National Historical Park. I'm also honored to welcome you to your park. We are so happy you're here. As the National Park Service celebrates its 105th birthday this month, we invite visitors to San Antonio Missions to reflect on the importance of outdoor recreation to American citizens' overall well-being this past year. San Antonio Missions National Historical Park is a place and has served as a place of recreation and respite. And I want to take a moment to thank our outstanding San Antonio Missions team, including our employees, our partners, and our volunteers for their dedication to preserving the legacy of community, diversity, inclusion, respect, and connection that is embodied in San Antonio Missions. The missions are central to the identity of mission descendant families, indigenous groups, community members, and neighborhoods such as the San Jose Neighborhood Association, the missions are seen as home to many, both a birthplace and a resting place for relatives, and the living landscape of interweaving cultures is essential to the very fabric of what it is to be from San Antonio. It is only fitting that tonight's ACAC content discussion, who's who, where, and when, is taking place right here next to the iconic Mission San Jose. As we have heard week after week, it is the stories of people that continue to bring, breathe life into the special places. The National Association of Interpretation defines interpretation process that forges emotional and intellectual connections between the interests of the audience and the meanings inherent in the resource. It is through world-class interpretation and preservation of the Spanish colonial architecture and agricultural features as included in the World Heritage Inscription that will ensure these internationally significant sites are protected for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. If you are planning to visit San Antonio Missions, we invite you to plan like a park ranger. Visit our website, download the app, or follow us on social media for tips to make the most of your park visit. San Antonio Missions is a unit of the National Park System, and together with Mission Valero, also known as the Alamo, the five sites managed by the National Park Service, Mission Concepcion, Mission San Jose, Mission San Juan, Mission Espada, and Rancho de los Cabros in Fort Floresville, all together comprise the World Heritage Site. We are the only UNESCO World Heritage Site in Texas. You can visit us any day of the week for a ranger-led tour at 11 o'clock, and you can visit us virtually as well. Thanks again so much for being here, and thank you to the commitment of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee for the dedication, leadership, and service you have shown our incredible San Antonio community, and welcome to your park. Thank you, Superintendent Jacobs. And next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee Tri-Chair, uh, Rebecca Villagran. Buenas tardes, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Villagran. I am one of your Tri-Chairs for the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. And we thank you all for joining us here tonight. And Sue Ann Pemberton, thank you. I'd also like to recognize, I believe, Assistant City Manager uh, Lori Houston is here, and I believe the Executive Director Kate Rogers is going to try and be here, and if she is not, I know she is tuning in and watching this. Our interpretive and museum consultants from PGAV Destinations and Gallagher and Associates are also here to listen as they have been partners with us through this whole content discussion. As a reminder, 
A schedule of meetings and the past videos are available on the city's website and the agendas are posted. You can find all of them at sanantonio.gov. And the next and final meeting will be on August 17th to discuss the civil rights movement. It will be live streamed at 5.30 p.m. on the city's YouTube channel. This is our sixth content discussion meeting of the summer, and thank you to the National Park Service and our superintendent for hosting us here tonight. We are at the queen of the missions, Mission San Jose, a great location for tonight's topic, who's who, where, and when. Every content discussion, we have all been having some items that we wanted to know more about, that we wanted to learn more about, and we hope we can have even more insight tonight. Figuring out which side people align, which means, means understanding terms and how they were used in different times. Group associations date back to the missions era and the Spanish caste system. An in-depth look at the divisions and alliances from the early 1800s through 1836 gives us many terms that can be applied to different peoples. Federalist, Centralist, War Party, Peace Party, Texian, Tejano, Mexican, all describe groups associated with Mexican and Texan independence, as well as indigenous. Creating a common glossary of group terms will help us understand how alliances and disloyalties shaped the Alamo's history over 300 years. We also know that lines and alignments aren't as easy. They're not easy at all, and some of them can be very complicated, as they were then, just as they are now. I'd like to thank the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee members who served as theme captains to help plan this meeting, Seneca McAdams, Wendell Hall, and Ms. George Cisneros. Seneca McAdams, one of our theme captains, will now introduce our experts for tonight's program. Thank you for participating, and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you. The bios for our speakers were sent out in advance, and I hope you all had a chance to take a look at them. Dr. Gerald Poyo received his PhD in Latin American history from the University of Florida. He is the O'Connor Professor in the History of Hispanic Texas and of the Southwest at St. Mary's University in San Antonio. His research has focused on Latino history, the intersection of Latin America and the U.S. Latino history, and the origins of the Tejano communities and colonial and Mexican Texas. His publications on Texas history have focused on San Antonio's Spanish and Mexican periods. A current book project is tentatively entitled Latino St. Mary's, the Making of a Historically Hispanic Serving University from 1852 to 1992. As O'Connor Chair, he also sponsors the Westside San Antonio Humanities Project website. Then we also have Dr. Greg Cantrell. He is the Irma and Ralph Lowe Chair in the Texas History and Director of the Graduate Studies for the Department of History at Texas Christian University. He previously taught at Sam Houston State, Hardin-Simmons University, and the University of North Texas. He received his PhD from Texas A&M University. He has authored several books and scholarly articles. His newest book, The, Tex the People's Revolt, The Texas Populace and the R Roots of the American Liberalism, was recently awarded the Kate Brooks Bates Award by the Texas State Historical Association, which is given to the best book of Texas history prior to 1900. But first, we are going to hear from Melissa Simmons with PGAV Destinations about tonight's discussions, how they align with the vision and guiding principles created by this community.
Good evening. As we look at the title of our discussion tonight, Who's Who, Where, and When, we think of the people, places, and events of history. These settings, dates, and personal stories are what help us to make history tangible, relatable, and memorable. They're the reason we still think of Friday the 13th as bad luck, how we know that the U.S. Capitol is in Washington, D.C., and even why we remember the Alamo. These aspects of history make a powerful story when we put them together. When we think about the who and the personal stories, we tend to think of the more famous names, such as Travis or Bowie. And while their letters reveal the personal thoughts and emotions, we also need to look for evidence of other stories to ensure we have a more complete picture of events. We often overlook the fact that the Texas Revolution was part of a Mexican Civil War. When Santa Ana and the government revoked the state's rights and centralized power in Mexico City, it sparked a civil war with rebellions and revolts all over Mexico, including in Texas. As it was a few decades later in the American Civil War, the Mexican Civil War pitted neighbor against neighbor and brother against brother. Even right here at the Alamo, where one family's personal story of the Battle of 1836 reveals political conflict among brothers. The Esparza family lived in Bejar, and brothers Francisco and Gregorio grew up and started families of their own here. In 1835, Gregorio Esparza was part of Colonel Seguin's company, while Francisco was part of the local Presidio Company of Bejar under the command of General Cos. The brothers fought on opposite sides during the siege of Bejar in October through December of 1835. Their political beliefs and military alignment pitted them against one another. After General Cos surrendered and retreated, both brothers resumed their lives in Bejar until Santa Ana's army arrived in February of 1836. Gregorio took his family into the Alamo with Colonel Seguin and other locals, while Francisco was part of the Mexican army and stayed in town. After the battle, Francisco requested to find his brother's body in the local, and to find and bury his brother's body in the local cemetery. Granted permission, Francisco and his brothers found Gregorio's body and interred him in the Campo Santo nearby. Gregorio, Gregorio Esparza may be the only Alamo defender to be buried and not burned. Imagine the emotions Francisco must have been feeling, searching through so many dead to try to find his brother, seeing friends and neighbors among the dead and not being able to give, him, give them a proper burial. While the Esparza name may not be as well known as some of the others at the Alamo, their story is a powerful reminder of the cost of war and the emotional toll of a civil war. In many of our past discussions, we have heard about why the Alamo was the site of the Battle of 1836, how the site has changed over time, and even who lived here. While we know about the Alamo grounds as the where, we can also look at the broader connections to past events and their modern sites today around San Antonio. We should, as stated in the guiding principles, enhance connectivity and wayfinding to the river, neighborhoods, La Lita, the cathedral, and the other plazas. These places are important both in the telling of the history of the Alamo and in the history of the city of San Antonio. Finally, the when gives us a specific time for historic events, whether that be a year, a month, a day, or an hour. While we all run our lives by the clock, time is intangible, and it's a difficult concept to really think about. However, knowing an event took place in the morning gives us context that we, we can relate to. Since we know the Battle of 1836 began around 5 a.m., we can picture a cool morning, quiet and still in the pre-dawn darkness, as the Mexican army began their attack. When we string several of these events together in the continuum of time, we can look both forward and backward to see how these early events might have influenced personal decisions and emotional responses in later ones. As stated in the guiding prints, the 1836 Battle of the Alamo, the most recent opportunity to tell the entire history of the Alamo area. Knowing the sequence of events, we can see the cause and effect of time, even how it influences things today. Interpretation strives to place history in its context not only as it relates to where we are today, but also as it was seen at the time. These three details, who, where, and when, give us the necessary context for understanding historical events. When we better understand history, we may start to relate and even empathize with people of the past, as the guiding principle states, allowing us to embrace the continuum of history to foster understanding and healing. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Poit.
and just push the button to get this started. Oh, okay. Mind if I... There's a screen down here that I'll be looking at. And I need a little... Thank you so much for having me here this evening. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I always uh, uh, like an opportunity to talk about the 18th century, the 18th century, which is what I'm going to talk about mostly tonight. Um, it's an era that uh, is critically important, but one that um, often is left out of lots of the stories of the history of Texas. So I wanted to um, talk about this in relation um, to uh, a particular, beginning with a particular moment, um, which was this moment of uh, 1832, uh, December 3rd, 1832, uh, when the Ayuntamiento, or the City Council of San Antonio, got together uh, in response to a gathering of Anglo-American settlers um, um, earlier on um, who complained and uh, about the law, the famous law of April, law of April 1930 that had closed the borders uh, between Texas and the United States. And also um, uh, prohibited immigration, um, started to put new, um, a greater military presence on the border, um, and was going to enforce the anti-slavery, um, the anti-slavery um, um, declaration of the Mexican government. So this, uh, so this, so the, so Stephen F. Austin had encouraged the the uh, Cabildo or the City Council of San Antonio to uh, to respond in a similar fashion. Um, but they didn't. They responded in their own fashion. And wh what I w wanted to do was to suggest why it is that, or wh what, what were the Tejanos thinking in this critical moment when the Anglo-Americans are really, um, really confronting the Mexican government in a rather heavy, heavy handed and heavy way. And the Tejanos found themselves in between these two forces and they, um, had to come up with a document, a statement, that represented their own views. And I think that this is important to know because sometimes uh, we think of Tejano responses during this period as simply immediate responses, knee-jerk responses to immediate situations. But in fact, uh, Tejanos were responding to their own traditions and to their own ways. Um, San Antonio had been around for uh, a, uh, a century before. They had their own traditions, their own interests. And so what I want to do this evening is talk about what those interests, political interests were um, in, in regard to this particular document. The, the, the representación dirigida por el ilustre ayuntamiento was dedicated to the uh, Congress in Saltillo. And it was a document that has been viewed um, as uh, again, from the perspective of, of uh, the moment, but it really harkened back to origin times. Uh, it spoke to historical memory and identity, and it spoke to the traditional suffering of me the Mexican people in Texas over many, many years, um, going back to the 18th century. Um, it emphasized the government's responsibility to the people or to the pueblo. Uh, they did not speak in terms of individual rights. They weren't, the Anglo-Americans were, were um, directing their, their, their discourse in terms of individual rights, um, ideas coming from the East. Uh, Tejanos were uh, working within a Catholic hierarchical world where individual rights was never the issue. It was the issue of the town, of the pueblo. And so this is what I want to uh, focus on. The Villa, or the Ayuntamiento, was established on July 2nd, 1731, uh, um, and it was a representation of the Pueblo. That is, 
uh, the, the ayuntamiento uh, was the voice of the local people in the Spanish Empire. Uh, it is where the local people had their voice. And in theory, that ayuntamiento was supposed to express the interests of the local people as a community and not as individuals. Um, it was a, of communal significance. And in terms of place, the plaza was where that uh, representation stood out. Uh, this is the uh, detail of the Menchaca map of 1764. Uh, you can see at the top the Alamo, and at the bottom is the Presidio. And in between, uh, you have the Plaza Mayor, um, or the civilian plaza, uh, between the church and the city, um, and the city uh, council. And it's in that plaza where people, um, uh, it would symbolize the power of the local people. It was called the Plaza Mayor. And it was the place of civil and religious authority between the, between the, the, the cathedral, or cathedral today, a church, parish church at the time, and um, the civil government. This is a detail from the Rutia map. Uh, look close, close into the, uh, the town itself, and you can see right there that uh, E is the Casas Reales, and the Casas Reales was the city council. Um, and, uh, and again, F is the iglesia, or is the church, and again, there's the, that's the plaza. Now, governance in, in Spanish Texas, as in most governments, uh, created all kinds of competing interests. So you had, uh, at the top of the hierarchy of the Spanish Empire, you had uh, the viceregal authorities that protected the interests of the crown. That was their job. Um, you had the provincial governors who mediated local and crown interests. Their job was to protect crown interests, but also to be sure that it was done um, in a way that didn't harm the local interests. And then you had the local government, as I mentioned, the, the cabildo, and that defended the local interests. Uh, that is uh, one of the famous viceroys of New Spain. That's an interesting image. Um, Antonio Maria de Bucarelli y Ursua. And he was viceroy between 1771 and 1779. Now, the Cabildo then was always in the business of trying to protect themselves and the local community. During the period from about 1770 through 1785, you had two uh, uh, important governors, Juan Maria uh, de Riperda and Domingo Cabello, who were um, sort of a new type of governor representing the new kind of governance in Spain under the Bourbon um, uh, kings. Um, and these new uh, Bourbon kings were reformists. They were trying to uh, extract as much wealth from the Americas as they could d d during these years and later. And these two governors were, in, uh, were, were sent to Texas to, in fact, establish a stronger uh, government control over local, local affairs. Um, it, it, the, the Bear Archives, which is a really wonderful archive, uh, I'm sure you all know of it up in Austin, um, has a lot of documents from this era uh, and the work of the Cabildo. And one of the things that the Cabildo was always uh, protecting was its local prerogatives. So the governor, uh, uh, governors, both these governors for all these years tried to get the Cabildo to build a new jail um, and, uh, and to build a new, a new um, a, um, city council building. And they wanted the local community to pay for it. But the local community said, well, that's not our job. We'll help you build it, but you need to come up with the resources. And the governor says, well, the crown doesn't have the resources. And so they got into this, um, this uh, struggle over many years. And the local cabildo insisted that they were not going to build the jail and the Casas Reales. Um, and these two governors continued to fight, and in the end, they were unsuccessful. And I, I tell this story because this is an example of the kinds of struggles that went on. This was a fairly, ultimately, fairly insignificant issue 
uh, uh, but it was a matter of tremendous principle, so that the local interests were critical uh, for the local uh, community. A more um, striking example was control over cattle resources. Um, there was a great struggle between the missions and the, and the city over, um, over control of cattle resources. Who had the right to certain, uh, to the cattle uh, in, and in which areas? This went on for quite a while. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the, uh, the commandant, commandant general of interior provinces, uh, Don Teodoro de Qua, was brought in. Uh, to try to resolve this issue, among uh, this and among uh, other, other issues. And so he sat down, le listened to the arguments by the missions and by the Cabildo, and he just threw up his arms and said, well, I'm going to resolve this. The, land be the, 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 the cattle belonged to the king. So basically he expropriated the cattle from the local community. And from then on, the people had to pay taxes in order to get the land. So this was a great defeat not only for uh, the Cabildo, but also for the missionaries. Um, and it, it was another example how, of how um, a foreign, foreign authority come in and had decided the future for the local community with, with uh, a great cost um, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of control of the cattle. Another one was, had to do with contraband trade. The Cabildo um, uh, knew that this was illegal. The, the Spanish crown did not allow trade between Texas and Louisiana. The local Cabildo knew it was illegal, but they, uh, as often uh, people do when they're not allowed to do things, they engaged in contraband trade uh, themselves. Um, and in fact, sometimes the governors themselves were involved in contraband trade. But as the, as the crown began to pressure uh, the governors more and more, the governors worked harder to try to stop this, this trade. So th this was one of the essential uh, sources of wealth for the community. They've, they traded to the south uh, legally, uh, but they could trade much more profitably with New Orleans. And this was simply not allowed. It was a matter of um, a law um, out of... Uh, out of Spain and, and uh, the Viceroyalty in Mexico City. Um, in addition to that, they uh, refused to allow the opening of a port, which the Tejanos had been asking for, the Cabildo had been asking for a port on the Texas coast. And this was also out of, um, was, was rejected out of hand. Why? Well, because the merchant, uh, the merchants in Mexico City uh, knew that if there was opening trade with New, with New Orleans, that they would lose out. Um, and so they, uh, they put a lot of pressure on to keep Louisiana closed. And so this was another issue uh, of, of local interest, which was creating tensions between the local community and the Crown. Finally, uh, the governors, the later governors, um, uh, between 1803 and 1809 began to um, challenged the authority of the Cabildo. The Cabildo was causing constant uh, trouble, constant uh, grievances. And so the governors finally be decided that perhaps they would be better off without a Cabildo uh, and that they could rule more directly. Um, so you had these two governors, Antonio Cordero and Manuel Salcedo, uh, who at first tried to eliminate the Cabildo altogether. They weren't successful in that. Um, but, they, um, but they were successful in reducing the size of the Cabildo. So this is all background information for what happens uh, during the teens. The Hidalgo Revolt in Mexico um, led to a revolt in San Antonio, 1810 to 1813. There were, as, there were um, essentially three insurrectionary leaders, Juan Bautista de las Casas, who was a retired military man who had come to San Antonio, and rose in support of the Hidalgo uh, Rebellion. In time, he was, in, in short order, he was overthrown because he became too authoritarian. And the local people uh, weren't quite sure um, how to m manage all of this. Um, Guti later on, Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara shows up and declares Mexican independence. 
Um, and what you end up seeing is that some Tejanos, uh, Bejareños, uh, join him and others remain loyal. Uh, later on, you have a third one who comes in, Jose La Alvarez de Toledo, who is openly uh, in support of annexation to the U.S. Um, and all of this created uh, a difficult situation for the Bejareños because um, they didn't know um, how all this was going to play out. Um, in, in time, the royalist leader, uh, General Joaquin Arredondo, comes in and, uh, and really oppresses, uh, uh, defeats the insurrectionists and, uh, and embark on a, on a very uh, harsh oppression of the, local, of the local population. So what do we learn from this? Um, all of this ended in a, in a collision uh, with lots of blood, lots of death. And the local elites ended up, uh, 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 an important portion of the local elites had to leave San Antonio and run to Louisiana. Um, the Cabildo was eliminated and people chose sides. Some joined the insurrectionists, some joined uh, the, um, um, the, the, the crown. The local economy was destroyed and local in, and, and, and specific uh, interests were destroyed. Um, and Crown Authority ultimately was reestablished. So this was a lesson, <coughs> an important lesson that the local people um, experienced that one cannot ignore in thinking about what happens in 1836. Uh, in a sense, they had already had the experience of forces from the South and forces from the East coming together and, um, and causing havoc and causing problems. They tried to figure out which way to go, and in the end, uh, they, they, were, uh, they suffered the consequences. So this period of 1811, uh, 1813 is, is, is essential story for putting the Tejano response later on in some kind of context. Um, it and, and, and it should not really be sort of background information, but rather a central, uh, a central discussion uh, to understand the politics of Tejanos uh, in the time of 1836. In 1821, you have Mexican independence. Uh, the, the, the Ayuntamiento uh, is established, is reestablished. Um, Behar swear, uh, swears allegiance to the Catholic religion and to Mexican independence and unity. Uh, they saw the downfall of the Spanish imperial crown, which they had, had viewed as detrimental to their cause uh, in the previous decade. But now they were going to be uh, under a, a new regime. And um, initially, they continued as the Ayuntamiento in the province of Texas. But in short order, in short order, they lost. Um, they lost uh, the statehood and became a, a junior partner in the state of Coila y Tejas. Um, and again, this was an outside, an outside imposition. Historical memory of the Tejanos is something that was alive and well. Um, they wrote, um, Jose Antonio Menchaca wrote a memoir, as did others. And in their memoirs, they wrote to redeem the history of their city and their people. Um, especially later on, when their culture and their history had been denigrated. Uh, when people began to talk about the birth of Texas coming with the arrival of the Anglos. And it was, the, and it was these, these, these Tejanos looking back and writing their memoirs and saying, we have our own history. And to understand what happened, you need to understand their history. 
that is Tejano history. Um, they did not fight for Anglo-American values as such or for annexation to the United States, but for their own civilization. They for that had been forged a century before, over the previous century. They, their idea was that Texas um, uh, should continue, uh, should, 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 be, should be a continuation, this new era uh, um, of independence, ultimately, sh should be a continuation of the past uh, with uh, now new, new elements in, involved, in, included. But it didn't work out that way. Um, and so they had to try to redeem this through their, through their writings. Um, and um, it's this historical memory then that I think needs to also be included in any kind of rethinking of how to tell the Alamo story. What, where did the Tejanos come from? What was their history? Um, what were their values? Um, they joined ultimately those who joined the Anglo-American uh, rebellion did so because they, had, they thought they had no other choice. Uh, th there were others, however, who, uh, would have, who preferred to try to stay loyal. And so this had to be sorted out as they had tried to sort the same thing out uh, during the wars of, uh, uh, of the, uh, during the Hidalgo era. Um, so I just, uh, as you think about this, uh, on how to rethink uh, the story, don't forget to tell the Tejano story in some depth. Uh, in the past, it has been told as sort of uh, background music, if you will, uh, but not with any clear sense of who these people were and where they came from and what their values were. Thank you very much. There I am. Okay. Uh, thank y'all for for inviting me to this. I I, I was uh, I was pleased that that uh, in my introduction they mentioned my 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 new book, but uh, you may be wondering why a guy who writes about populism in the 1890s was asked to do this. And I think the, probably the reason is that I wrote a biography of Stephen F. Austin uh, about 20 years ago, and that's that that's probably why I'm. Uh, sometimes included in these kinds of gatherings uh, dealing with the Texas Revolutionary Era. There's one thing that I suspect you've learned already uh, from these gatherings, uh, and it's that history is, uh, well, complicated, right? Uh, for many decades, the story of what happened in Texas between 1821 and 36 was mostly understood as an expression of of manifest destiny, so-called, the, the inevitable spread of Anglo-American culture, Republican government, uh, Protestant Christianity over a savage frontier peopled by uh, wild Indians and a few backward Mexicans. In the early 20th century, this view of the period received sort of scholarly dressing in the uh, works of Frederick Jackson Turner and Eugene C. Barker. And it persists to a surprising degree uh, even today. Uh, in the past quarter century, a few brave or we might say suicidal students of the period have turned that version of Texas, the sort of heroic version of Texas history on its head, uh, portraying these same events as an invasion of Mexican Texas by greedy unprincipled Anglo adventurers and land speculators. Uh, who exploited Mexico's generous land policies and, and with racist aggression wrested Texas from its rightful owners, the Tejanos, in order to establish a slaveholder's republic. I would argue that the time may have come for us to move, by, move beyond these simplistic interpretations, and I, I hope that the Alamo uh, site, when, it's, uh, when it is redone, will be able to, to, to some extent, achieve that. Uh, these simplistic interpretations tend to rely heavily on heroes and villains, and to a certain extent, I think they reflect one's current p 
political or ethnic identification. And I think we can do better than that. So what I thought I would do with my little bit of time to, tonight is, is talk a little bit about the relations between Anglos and Tejanos uh, in the 1820s and 30s and delve a little bit into the attitudes that they held toward one another. Now, as we all know, Anglo-American immigration into Texas began in 1821 when Stephen F. Austin received permission to introduce 300 families into the region between the Brazos and Colorado rivers. Austin promised to bring peaceable, law-abiding Catholic settlers from the United States who would become Mexican citizens. And by 1824, he had proven true, uh, more or less, to his uh, promise. If one overlooks the fact that most of the colonists were at best Catholics in name only. Uh, and at that point, their, their respect for Mexican laws had rarely been put to a serious test. Austin's title was impresario or colonization agent. And that meant that he was responsible for recruiting settlers, surveying lands, uh, securing titles, enforcing the law, acting as liaison between his colonists and the Mexican government. Austin took his responsibility seriously, considering himself and his colonists to be proud, naturalized Mexican citizens. Now, from the beginning, the response of the Tejanos to the coming of the Anglos was mixed. Austin first visited Goliad in 1821, his first trip to Texas. Uh, the young empresario received a warm welcome there from the local parish priest, Jose Valdez. Valdez's friendliness was not entirely selfless. He soon let Austin know that he, uh, he, he wanted to be appointed curate of the new colony, a position that held the promise of lucrative fees uh, and perhaps opportunities in land as well. That appointment never materialized, but Valdez was not the last Tejano to see an opportunity in the coming of the Anglos. Austin soon built a dynamic political coalition and business relationships uh, with Tejano elites such as the Seguins and Navarros, and with powerful Coahuilan capitalists such as the Viesca brothers of Paris. This alliance gave Angles and Tejanos a significant voice in the legislature at Saltillo, even though, as Jerry pointed out, they were really the junior partners in that, in, in that cobbled together state of Coahuila y Tejas, uh, outnumbered 10 to 1 initially in, in membership in the state legislature. But from the start, there were also Tejanos who mistrusted the Anglos' intentions. When Austin visited Goliad in 1821, one of the town's uh, councilmen, Manuel Becerra, reported to Alcalde Tomas Buenteo that Austin's actions and motives were suspicious. Concerned that Austin might be a spy, Becerra also reported that during the entire trip, no religious act was observed. A very troubling sign to him. Alcalde Buenteo concluded that none of Austin's men appeared to be the legitimate families who were supposed to come, which was true at that point. And they spoke nothing but English the entire time, and Buenteo offered the opinion that, quote, they will be more harmful than beneficial. Which leads us to the crucial issue of attitudes that Tejanos and Anglos held and formed toward one another. Historians such as David Weber and Arnaldo de Leon viewed that Anglos who came to Texas in this era brought with them preconceived attitudes toward the Mexicans. These attitudes had their roots in the so-called black legend, a stereotype of Spaniards dating far back into European history. According to the black legend, Spaniards and their Mexican descendants were bigoted, cruel, greedy, tyrannical, fanatical, treacherous, and lazy, and their systems of government author authoritarian, corrupt, and decadent. And there are plenty of quotes from Anglo travelers and colonists that can be cited as evidence that some colonists did hold these attitudes. Perhaps the best known of these quotations come, came from none other than Stephen Austin. Uh, when, having traveled through the heart of Mexico in 1822-23, he remarked that, quote, the people are bigoted and superstitious to an extreme, and indolence appears to be the general order of the day. Uh, to be candid, the majority of the people of the whole nation, as far as I have seen them, want nothing but tales to be more brutes than the apes, unquote. 
But Anglos, of course, possessed no monopoly on stereotyping. Mexicans were capable of holding or forming similarly negative views of the incoming Anglos, portraying the Anglos as crude, greedy, irreligious, lawless adventurers. In 1828, a Mexican army officer described the rank and file of Austin's colonists as, quote, lazy people of vicious character and concluded that kindness and courtesy are very rare things among individuals of that nationality. Clearly, cultural differences did hold the potential for distrust and misunderstanding. Such basic matters as language, religion, legal traditions, and political culture could differ in important ways. Americans believe that it was there, in contrast to, to what Jerry uh, uh, so ably outlined with the, with the, uh, with the Tejanos, Anglo-Americans believed that it was their inalienable right to abuse their elected officials and hold public meetings to protest government policies, a belief which contrasted sharply with Mexican and Spanish political uh, traditions. And despite newly independent Mexico's Republican government, it retained certain mercantilist economic pra practices uh, that struck Anglos as unwise or oppressive, such as the, the just to just give a trivial example, the, the, gov the official government monopoly on the sale of tobacco. Uh, differences in legal traditions added to the confusion. Anglos, for example, came from a culture where trial by jury was enshrined in law, and it wouldn't be a good historical um, uh, presentation if I didn't have an anachronistic picture of a trial by jury with Gregory Peck there. Uh, the system that had involved in Spanish Texas lacked trial by jury. J judges actively engaged in fact-finding and sought to resolve conflicts in ways that, that reconciled the interests of the contending parties. Yet despite these differences, the era's history offers at least as much evidence of coexistence and cooperation and common interest as it does of misunderstanding, distrust, and conflict. Austin spoke for many of the Anglo settlers when he declared that Coahuila and Texas, quote, has the most liberal and munificent government on earth to immigrants, unquote. Austin's relationships with Erasmus Seguin, Jose Antonio Navarro, and Ramon Musquiz, and with Mexican national leaders like Lorenzo de Zavala and Lucas Alemán, were truly intimate friendships as well as business and political alliances. Now, Austin was exceptional in many ways, but there are numerous other examples of Anglos who developed cordial relationships with native Mexicans. Jim Bowie, for example, married uh, Ursula, er, Ursula uh, Veramendi, uh, the daughter of the provincial lieutenant governor, and settled permanently in San Antonio. As James Crisp, who spoke earlier this year at, at one of these sessions, has pointed out, the black legend um, could actually serve as a source of American sympathy and tolerance for Mexicans uh, in the 1820s. Uh, Anglo-Americans in, in that era frequently compared Mexico's independent struggle against Spain with that of the uh, British colonies against George III. Anglos commonly attributed Mexican superstitious, superstition, indolence, and authoritarianism, as they saw them, to the three centuries of despotic Spanish rule. And many Anglos believe that, that now that Mexicans had seized freedom and embraced Republican government, they would now advance rapidly in, in morals, industry, and good government. Maybe the best way to make sense of these complex, often contradictory attitudes and relationships that developed between Anglos and Tejanos is to rethink the, the fundamental nature of pre-revolutionary Texas. Anglo-Americans spoke and thought of Texas as a frontier region. Um, frontier in this context meant a line beyond which civilization had not yet arrived, or as Stephen Austin often put it, a wilderness uh, waiting to be redeemed. Mexicans had a similar conception of the frontera, as they called it, although they tended to view the frontera not so much as a region waiting to be civilized, but rather as a more or less permanently uh, depopulated zone, or, or, or despoblado, as they would have called it, uh, protecting the civil, uh, 
that, 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 was, that was there to re really to protect the civilized regions to the south in, in Mexico proper. Um, the reality, of course, is that prior to 1836, neither Americans nor Mexicans had fully realized their long-term. Um, the Americans had not fully redeemed Texas from its wilderness state, and the Mexicans had not created the, the stable buffer zone that they needed. If anything, the dominant power in Texas in this era was the Comanches, although the Anglo colonies in San Antonio mostly lay beyond the normal boundaries of what historian Pekka Hamelainen has called the Comanche Empire. And if, if there's one book that'll, that'll really, I think, help you rethink your, your thoughts about Texas in this era, I recommend that, that book, The Comanche Empire, for those of you who've not read it. Um, I think maybe it's more useful to apply historian Greg Gregory Noble's definition of a frontier as a region in which no culture, group, or government uh, can claim effective control or hegemony over others. Such places, in Noble's words, are characterized by a multi-sided struggle for control. The Fredonian Rebellion of 1826-27 offers one convenient example of this multi-sided struggle. Uh, when, American, when an American, Hayden Edwards, and a handful of his Anglo followers mounted a rebellion against Mexican authority over in East Texas, in the Nacogdoches area, he was opposed by a coalition of local Anglo and Tejano settlers. Uh, some local Cherokees joined with the rebels, at which point San Antonio political chief Jose Antonio Salcedo assembled Tejano troops, marched to San Felipe, the, the capital of Austin's colony, um, and uh, where they were joined by Stephen F. Austin and his colony's militia. And together, this mixed uh, Mexican and Anglo military force marched to Nacogdoches and put down the rebellion. Really, the, 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 the rebels fled before, the, before there was really any fighting. In, in hindsight, the Fredonian Rebellion sort of resembles comic opera, but it can tell us a lot about the real nature, I think, of Mexican Texas in, in this era. Consider several points. The Nacogdoches region was occupied by this diverse population of Tejanos, Anglos, other ethnic Europeans, plus the semi-Europeanized Cherokees, who were themselves recent immigrants from the American Southeast and, and who owned enslaved Africans. Edwards had received his impresario grant in the first place because Mexican legislators in Coahuila wanted to develop the region. Austin called the Fredonians a party of infatuated madmen, and his colonists turned out unhesitatingly to aid the Tejanos in putting down the rebellion. Furthermore, it turns out the Cherokees themselves were badly divided over the affair when the revolt disintegrated, pro-Mexican Cherokees hunted down the pro-Fredonian Cherokees and executed them. The revolt then pitted Anglos, Tejanos, and Cherokees against Anglos and Cherokees. If ever there was a multi-sided struggle, this was it. And as the Fredonian Rebellion shows, the presence of Indians greatly added to the complexity of ethnic relations in Mexican Texas. Acknowledging Anglo aggression towards Indians, it's still worth noting that at times the Tejanos had attitudes and policies towards Indians that were at least as hostile as those of the Anglos. Austin once narrowly escaped probable death at the, at the hands of a band of Comanche warriors by explaining to the Comanches that he was an Americano, not a Mexicano, upon which the Indians let him go in peace. On another occasion, the Tejano military commander in San Antonio ordered Austin's militia to attack the home village of the Waco Indians, side of present-day Waco, um, but feeling that the, the uh, attack was bad policy, Austin uh, delayed and delayed and finally convinced the Tejano officer to rescind the order. The point of relating such stories is to emphasize that, that competition and conflict on the Texas frontier was not a two-way street, Anglo versus Mexican, or even three-way, Anglo versus Mexican versus Indian, but rather that it consisted of sort of ever-shifting alliances and coalitions that defy simple generalizations. It's worth noting also that several free blacks 
immigrated from the United States and settled in Texas before the revolution. And at least three, Hendrick Arnold, William Goyans, and Samuel McCullough Jr. served the Texian cause during the war. Their presence seemed to elicit little controversy, even though most Anglo-Texans and many Tejanos were supporters of slavery to one degree or another. For Austin's part, he often felt more frustration with his own colonists than he did with the Tejanos. I do say, this is a quote from Austin, I do say that the North Americans are the most obstinate and difficult people to manage that live on the earth, Austin wrote in 1830. In one celebrated incident, Austin's colonists tarred, feathered, and expelled from the colony a malcontent who had threatened to burn down the land office. I mention such an incident because it helps us to put Anglo-Tejano conflicts into their appropriate context. It's true that Austin's colonists had little day-to-day -day contact with Tejanos due to the distance between their settlements. Uh, but another Anglo impresario, Green DeWitt, established his impresario colony immediately adjacent to that uh, of the Mexican impresario, Martin de Leon who was the founder of Victoria. Unfortunately, the legislature had, had overlapped the two grants, almost guaranteeing conflict between the two groups of settlers. In 1826, a serious incident occurred. Some Anglo settlers had imported some contraband tobacco into DeWitt's colony, and the political chief in San Antonio ordered De Leon to confiscate, and only some timely mediation by Stephen F. Austin aver averted bloodshed. Not long after, however, Austin himself came into conflict with De Leon. De Leon has sent his son Fernando to sell corn to Austin's colonists. And when Fernando quarreled with an Anglo colonist and threatened his life, Austin had Fernando jailed. The incident was resolved peacefully, but some of the De Leons always resented the Anglos thereafter. But, and this is, I think, is significant. Several other members of the extensive De Leon clan apparently took Austin's side in the dispute and continued to maintain warm relations with the American. These sort of episodes are easy to read, uh, cited as evidence of specifically ethnic conflict between Anglos and Tejanos. And certainly the fact that the contestants in these disputes uh, were Anglos and Tejanos makes it easy to ascribe ethnic or cultural factors as the cause of the problems. But these were precisely the same sorts of conflicts that often occurred wholly within Anglo communities, as we've seen, or wholly within Tejano communities. The, the point here is not that ethnic differences didn't exist, but rather that conflicts between Anglos and Tejanos were rarely exclusively ethnic in nature. So, when we consider the Texas Revolution and the Battle of the Alamo in light of the complex racial and ethnic situation in Texas, there are a few final things I think are important to keep in mind. First, the bulk of the Anglo population lived many miles east of the Tejano population centers of San Antonio and Goliad. Um, although Anglo and Tejano elites had considerable in, uh, elites, people like Austin and, and the Seguins, Navarros, uh, had considerable interaction with one another, common folk mostly didn't. Um, another important, and, and, and because the Anglos and Tejanos li lived this mainly sort of segregated, these, these lives that were segregated from one another by geography, uh, they really didn't have very many opportunities to build uh, wide, widespread inter-ethnic uh, relationships. Another important point which Andrew Torgett made when he spoke to you, uh, but I think which bears repeating, is that the Tejano elite shared, m many of the Tejano elite shared Austin's vision of a Texas made prosperous by the cotton economy, an economy dependent on slavery. And prior to 1836, the Tejano and Anglo leadership were united, mostly united, in their support of federalism a system that gave the states much autonomy in matter those to participate in the revolution uh, on the texas side at, at least eight eight maybe nine tejanos died in the alamo siege once again tejano company distinguished itself at san jacinto 
And two Tejanos, uh, Jose Antonio Navarro and Francisco Ruiz, signed the uh, famously signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. Anglo and Mexican Texans then were at times uneasy neighbors between 1821 and 35, but they remained neighbors. Some Anglos learned Spanish, traded with the Tejanos, proudly wore titles such as alcalde, and served in the state congreso. Some Tejanos learned English, traded with the Anglos, and supported Anglos in their quest to keep slavery uh, legal. Um, In 1835, most Tejanos joined their fellow Texans in opposing the centralist takeover of the national government. Um, Tejanos supported Anglos in their quests not only to keep slavery legal, but in, uh, in 1834, with Santa Ana's approval, the legislature made English an official language of the state and established trial by jury. Cultural conflict was always present, but so was multicultural cooperation. We might do well to bo borrow a term from our friends, the historical geographers, and describe Texas as a frontier of inclusion in which ethnic relations frequently assumed a positive character. Within such a frontier, groups might indeed contend and compete with one another for land, power, or resources, but such competition took place within an atmosphere of tolerance for the other group's right to exist. I don't pretend to know how such ideas can be fully communicated at a historical site like the Alamo, but I will leave it to smarter minds than mine to make sure that it happens. Thank you. Thank you, Drs. Cantrell and Poyo, for those presentations. Uh, so now we're going to take a 10-minute break and reconvene uh, in about 10 minutes for a panel discussion. So for those of you uh, joining us online, we have a short video from the Alamo while you wait. And we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Richardson and I work in the learning programs department here at the Alamo. And uh, of course the Alamo is a well-known battle, uh, but first thing I would like to share with you folks is that is one of eight battles fought within 20 miles of where I'm standing here in downtown San Antonio over a 30-year period. So between 1810 and 1840, there's not one, there's not two, there's eight battles fought within 20 miles of downtown San Antonio. And San Antonio, by the way, is more than 300 years old. So we're gonna to talk today, not about the Battle of the Alamo, we're gonna talk about a very significant battle which took place uh, in the same time frame during the Texas Revolution, uh, only a, a few yards from where we're standing. So we're gonna show you, we're gonna help you understand the importance of that. So behind me, uh, to the north, uh, you're gonna see a tall building. That's the Medical Arts Building built in 1926. And uh, on the south side here, we have uh, the end of the Long Barrack, part of the original Alamo compound. So that's gonna be our landmark, will be uh, the Medical Arts Building. We get down to our next location, we're going to give you a, a, a perspective of how far we are away from that building, which is not very far at all. So uh, we're starting here in what's Alamo Plaza, but the actual battlefield we'll be visiting is uh, five, six blocks uh, west of here. So our next stop is gonna be uh, close to Soledad Street, one of the primary uh, lines of battle. And uh, we'll give you the visual perspective, once again, of looking towards uh, the east, towards the Medical Arts Building to give you that visual perspective of how close the battlefield was to the Alamo, which people are more familiar with. So that'll be our, our next stop on our tour.
We have walked about 700 yards west of where we started on East Houston Street. And uh, if you see behind me, you can see uh, that medical arts building, which is again, parallel to the Alamo compound. So we've walked a relatively short distance and we're just a matter of a few yards from the actual battlefield. So this gives you a visual perspective on the proximity, how close this battlefield is to the more famous battlefield that became the Alamo. And uh, I'm standing basically on the bridge which crosses the San Antonio River. So Soledad Street, which will be our next stop, sits on the banks of the San Antonio River and Soledad and what's now called Main Avenue were the two main streets that they fought down in this famous battle, fought December 5th, December 9th of 1835, the Battle of Behar, B-E-X-A-R, but pronounced Behar. So uh, this gives you that visual perspective of how close we actually are. And we actually, we are slightly lower than the Alamo. Most places, when you go to the river, wherever that river is, you go down to the river, right? There are exceptions. Uh, New Orleans being one of those exceptions where you actually go up to the river, right? But here, like most places, you go down. So it's not a huge difference, but we are, the Alamo, actually sits 16 feet higher than our last stop, which would be Main Plaza. So the Alamo is important because it overlooks the river and overlooks the town, but that town is important enough to fight in the town and for the town for five consecutive days. Again, December 5th, December 9th of 1835. So our next stop is gonna be Soledad Street, where some of the heaviest fighting took place during this uh, Battle of Behar. So we're standing on Soledad Street and uh, just a few yards away from where we left you off. And behind me are some, several old buildings, but that actually was the location of one of the primary uh, houses they occupied in the first day of the battle. The battle begins December 5th, early morning hours, 1835. Uh, the Mexican army is in the town, has control of the entire area. Uh, the rebel camp is just north of us, and they're gonna enter the town early morning hours, once again, December 5th, coming down uh, Soledad Street, coming down uh, the uh, next street over, just to the west, uh, now called Main Avenue. It was called Calle de Asequia, Asequia Street in those days. And they'll be fighting building to building, house to house, uh, not for one, not for two, but actually for four consecutive days. The battle itself is five days of heavy house to house fighting. So uh, when a rebel camp, uh, a lefty rebel camp entered the town, they secured two buildings early on, the Veramendi and De La Garza. Again, Veramendi would be behind me and the De La Garza is just gonna be to the north of us. And they secured a foothold, unadded uh, reinforcements to that foothold and then just progressed further uh, south uh, down Soledad Street, uh, down what's now called Main Avenue over a period of days. So we're gonna share with you some of the uh, important people involved in this battle uh, among the rebels, particularly uh, Colonel uh, Benjamin Milam and uh, Colonel Frank Johnson are gonna lead the assault into the town. There are multiple uh, eyewitness accounts where Milam had gathered the volunteers together, uh, taken his rifle and uh, drawn a line in the dirt and said, who will follow old Ben Milam into San Antonio? And they will establish that initial foothold uh, in the Veramendi, in the De La Garza, right here on Soledad Street, securing a foothold on the edge of uh, Main Plaza.
Welcome back. We're ready to start with the panel portion of our evening. So I'd like to introduce Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee member George Cisneros to moderate the discussion. George. This is a, a rather fascinating panel tonight, and I feel very honored to be part of the, of the team here as a, as a moderator. Uh, this is the first time I felt that we're dealing with much of the emotional and almost spiritual aspect of relationships. Up until now, we've been doing a lot of dates, times, figures, uh, a lot of the, the hard issues of history. But today we're talking about relationships. And it does not surprise me that we have two scholars here and we have a brilliant theologian with us as well tonight. And all three of these presenters are from faith-based institutions. And there is something about the spirituality and the emotions and the nature of relationships that maybe are bigger than fact and figures and casualty numbers that perhaps a non-faith institution might give preference to. So I want to say that I'm very grateful that we have these scholars with us tonight. Uh, they're very important people. They understand the sacraments and they understand the rituals of life in, in a way that perhaps other historians may not uh, prioritize. And those uh, particular things that I have an interest in, and they are in their statements uh, through the, between the lines, are those elements of burial and marriage. And we are facing the issue of burial, and Ramon has been very, very dominant voice in studying and presenting to us the necessity of archiving, understanding, and factualizing the buried people. It's a very important ritual in, in our life. It's a life thing. The other thing is marriage. And that is where my issue has always been about titles and licenses and lease agreements. And in marriage, you sometimes use your land as the dowry to the, the Anglo husband that's marrying the Hispanic daughter. And titles and land were lost through marriage. or the daughter is the only child, and so she's going to inherit the ranch, though she's married to the Anglo settler. And so these things, to me, have been very, very critical parts of my arrogance and my uh, attitude during this whole process because ownership and burial are very important to me. And uh, so I, I'm just using this as kind of a, a preview into our, my, the thoughts we're going to be going the rest of this evening. And uh, so it's, uh, it's really great to introduce uh, Father uh, Bob Wright. And uh, I've always laughed whenever I've started a name because we hear of the Wright brothers, but I was thinking him as the Wright father. And uh, uh, I've heard him speak many, many a time at Oblate, and I've gone to, to uh, retreats and, and events there. And he's always brought great, great insight. Uh, I, I find it very important that we have the scholar here who can talk about the Hispanic community, the Catholic community of Texas. It is, it is, it is just to understand that relationship that was scoffed at by the, by the park ranger earlier about separation of church and state. It is very important that church and state work together because we're human beings. And I don't have a half of me that says state and a half of me that says church. My heart runs in both directions. And I have to keep my faith and my history as a working model. So I've said enough. I'd like to hear from uh, Father Wright. Uh, your insights tonight uh, about the, the relationship that the church has had with this community uh, since the church came here, since creation day. How about we go back that far? Thank you. Is, is this on? Is it on? Are we on? You can hear? Okay. Now it's on. Okay. Um, I've asked them to put up what Jake Ivey presented to you all as one of the one of the images of the Alamo, um, uh, that part of the Alamo which we, which we refer to so often as the site of the battle and so on, or the the the, the, uh, 
if we could, is it still up there? Okay, there, thank you. Um, what is the Alamo Chapel? Where is the Alamo Chapel? On that diagram, where is the Alamo Chapel? It's those two box X's going up toward the top on the north. That was the Chapel of the Alamo from about 1763 until at least the, um, at least 1815 or 18, probably even more beyond that. This other building was never finished. What you refer to as the Alamo Chapel was never a chapel. It was a burial ground. It was never a chapel. So the Alamo Chapel, and most of the diagrams of the Alamo, even now they've made a straight wall. What exists at the Alamo now is a straight wall sort of across that whole from the bell tower all the way across there. So you're missing more than half of the Alamo Chapel. That was built as a sacristy originally. It was built as a sacristy. As they were building the church, that was built as a sacristy, and it's symbol, it shows that the roofs were already done, just like the bell tower roofs were done. So those parts were done. And then... In between the bell tower over there on the left and the chapel, those two, those two uh, rectangles going up, that was the uh, sort of supposed to be the, the anti-sacristy to the chapel. And so it actually becomes a sacristy during the colonial period. And those, I, I sort of, Jake got those measured correctly. Those are about the sizes of what they were. So that was where the people worshipped. That was where the natives worshipped. That's where any Hispanics came who worshipped. That's where the Alamo Company worshipped. That's where they worshipped. That was their liturgical center. So I, I hope, you know, when you design whatever you finally do, I hope you sort of give proper recognition to the fact that what you see now as a little box room is only less than one half of the chapel, which was the worship space for these communities, for these people. Uh, kind of thing. So if nothing else, draw, draw a line in the concrete or something outside the building to sort of say, well, this is actually the original walls of the chapel. And there are descriptions of the, of the there were descriptions if you, for displays and so on of the kind of images that were in there. Because in 1772, the uh, Franciscans from the Careto College uh, said they were gonna, they were going to now leave Texas to go to California, to go to Arizona. And, uh, and so the Zacatecan friars took over. So there's a very detailed inventory of every statue, every image, every item that was in there kind of thing. Um, and so that was the religious heart of the community from, once again, from about 1763, according to Jake, and, until in the 1815s, you finally hear about, that's when the Alamo Company was briefly, uh, briefly decommissioned until, until 1817 because of precisely the, the, the Gutierrez Mag expedition, all the fights that were going on, the Arredondo uh, commotion and so on. Everything was sort of in turmoil then. And at that point, around 1815 or 16, I noticed in the records that they stopped baptizing anymore in that chapel. They, maybe it sort of stayed as a worship space, but from then on, all the baptisms were still registered in San Fernando Parish, which is now the cathedral. Another important point to recognize during this time is that the... Um, there was besides, you know, from, from 1793 on when it ceased being a mission, when it starts becoming the Pueblo of Valero and their chapel, and then 1802, 1803, the Alamo Company comes in, it's their chapel also shared with them. There's also uh, a military chaplain for the Behar Company. There's a military chaplain for the Behar Company, and those records are lost. So whenever you think you're calculating the total population of San Antonio from the church records, you're missing a whole, you're missing the whole of the military families in doing that. And also, there was also a chaplain for the Alamo Company. So there was usually three priests, and it's sometimes even more when they, when they brought in more troops from Nuevo Leon and, and uh, Nuevo Santander, precisely with the border, with the border conflicts going on with, uh, with uh, first the French and then, and then the United States. So there was a tremendous presence here. And uh, so that very general question, how was the church involved? Of course, it was involved with the missions and the missionaries that work with the Indians. Once the place is secularized, once it's no longer a mission, it's still a, a community that has its own uh, chapel there. Uh, that it, During that period from 1793 to the Alamo Company for those six or seven years, the pastor of San Antonio takes care of it, or else the missionaries help out kind of thing. And then they get their own chaplain. The Alamo Company has its own chaplain. Uh, up until um, 
They're decommissioned, basically. And the Behar Company has its own chaplain, Father Francisco Minas, until 1834 when he dies. He dies just two years, one year before the revolution. Uh, and so, and, and how this all works out is um, um, they talked about very much about the, the, those 1811 to 1813 years. Um, in San Antonio at that time, you can sort of see the division in the community. And I think what you've heard before also from Gilberto Hinojosa and other people and also our presenters here is that you sort of had some families like the Seguins and the Navarros and so on who tended to side very much with the incoming economy, with the incoming uh, thing that was happening and so on. Um, and you had others that, uh, of course, this is before this is before those people came in. But so when you had that revolt, when you had that revolution in 1811 and 1813, that was precisely to try and uh, have a more um, have a more uh, independence from Spain. Those priests divided in San Antonio. The pastor of San Antonio was dismissed. He was chased out of town by the royalists when they came back over. He was also the the military chaplain of the Bayhart Company was also dismissed because they were seen as two of the leaders. They were seen as two of the leaders of the revolt in San Antonio with Las Casas. Uh, the, uh, the Alamo Company itself was the ones that were recognized as remaining most faithful, most royalist. They were the ones that sort of remained most loyalist with their leaders at that time. Uh, their chaplain also disappeared, though. Uh, and who, who came in were two priests from the outside who came in to sort of take over those positions of pastor of San Antonio and the pastor of the, and the chaplain of the Alamo Company. Um, I'll just say maybe a few more things and then open up for questions, right? When, uh, when you come to the point of the precisely Mexico becoming independent, 1820, 1821, I was just mentioning to Greg that I think that the priest that uh, Stephen F. Austin first ran into in San Antonio uh, in, in, to, to sort of said, I'd like to be your chaplain, was actually the pastor of San Antonio, Refugio de la Garza. Uh, at least that's how I read, that's how I read the, uh, Austin's diary. And he said, I'd like to be... And so as uh, something which... Um, um, my colleague here, <laughs> Jerry. Jerry, yes, <laughs> Jerry and Greg will, will explain more about, a lot of things happened, a lot of attitudes and politi political positions were changing in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And so you had these priests and different people who were already starting to get more ideas of, of a more, of a more people-based kind of society, not so much of a monarchical or hierarchical society, more kind of thing. And, um, Refugio de la Garza was the, to the Mexican National um, Congress, to the Mexican National, to the, to the, when they started to, to develop their new, their new system. He is the one that helped Stephen F. Austin get his colonization contract. He is the one that was on the five or six person committee, besides that one, to have no import taxes. Uh, so he was very favorable to that. But later on, we get we sort of pass up the time we're talking about when you get into the revolt period and so on. Well, by that time, he's sort of seen a different angle. Texas seen as more and more anti-Catholic and more and more. Uh, what he saw what was happening in Nacogdoches, what was happening in Goliad, and uh, by that time, he sort of tossed his lot with staying faithful to Mexico. So it is. It's a very complex issue, and I just want to point out there was there was pre on uh, This is the population was. Now. What we see in this period of history, uh, say beginning in uh, 1750 forward, we see worldwide on political theory and the creation of the concept of self-governance, uh, uh, the, the elimination of kings, emperors, and things of this sort. Uh, uh, this is a question to all three. How deep were the political and philosophical uh, influence of the Enlightenment on the leaders of the Mexican Revolution of of between starting in 1811 all the way through 1821. Just how much did the Enlightenment and the successful revolutions in France and the United States influence the the actions in Mexico? Is this working? Oh yeah. Um, I think talking about San Antonio. Um, the Enlightenment was something that um, probably most uh, of the local population didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about. Uh, this is a small community way on the northern reaches of the empire. Uh, that's, but that's not to say that it didn't have some influence among, among the elites. Um, um, the, 
uh, the local leaders, uh, when they, the, the ones that were formally educated, would go to uh, Monterrey, uh, and they would be, and there they, they would um, be taught the latest, the latest in particularly Catholic theology, which was a, uh, which was going through a liberalizing uh, moment, where um, where there was not uh, necessarily a contradiction. Uh, between the sort of hierarchical uh, 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 Catholic world and a, a sense of uh, local autonomy, uh, whereas before that it was it, it, it's it, the, the the church um, looked to the empire and to the vice regal authorities, but if you if you uh, just take a look, just think about Hidalgo, for example, who was a priest and how he was able to uh, uh, reject the Spanish and at the same time uh, embrace Catholicism, which, by, which of course uh, it was also very hierarchical and much influenced by Spain. Uh, but for him, there was no contradiction. And so I think that that plays out in similar ways in San Antonio. Um, but but my, my thinking about this is that those ideas were less important than the sort of basic idea of defending your particular interests uh, in your in your geographical space. Um, so when um, so when the so when you get um, people from the outside, like Las Casas and like uh, Gutierrez de Lara um, and Álvarez de Toledo, and then uh, who who actually are are in some ways agents of of forces in the United States. Uh, and then later you get Arredondo coming north from the outside fight to fight these people who were coming from the east. And all of this is taking place in San Antonio. The local people are having to figure out what to do with this and how to deal with it. Uh, and so I think that is a, a stronger uh, issue than necessarily sitting around philosophizing about what are my rights? What, you know, what am I? Uh, they're, they're in, in the past, this has been interpreted, the, the, this period has been interpreted as sort of uh, a, a nod towards uh, an, an liberal American ideals among the Mexicans. Uh, but I think that's a total misreading. I, I, think, I think the local Mexican population was thinking about themselves, about their issues, about their communities. Um, and these bigger philosophical issues were not really a central feature in, in these events. Okay. Uh, now, in San Antonio, what was basically the attitude of the clergy and the church about political rabble rousing among from local leaders in terms of the revolution? What would, what, what would the church's position have been at that time when local activists were pushing for revolutionary and progressive ideas? Well, I think, I think there were elements of the church that were behind that. Uh, in Monterrey, uh, Gutierrez de, de Lara had a, uh, had a brother who was a priest and was very Im involved in disseminating revolutionary ideology. And Hidalgo himself was a priest. So uh, now the higher echelons of the church... Uh, um, obviously probably would have been opposed to it because they would have been much more closely connected to the imperial um, establishment. And in that sense, um, um, there would have been a, there was, there was a, a rupture there between the higher um, church officials and uh, people at the grassroots who were having to deal with the day-to-day -day problems and issues um, that ultimately contributed to these revolutionary movements. Jerry, uh, if I could add something, okay? Yeah. The, the, um, for one thing, anybody who was educated at that time in Mexico was educated in what was, what was basically a seminary. But the seminary provided all the education to everyone. You, you, went, to, you went to school for civil and church law together. You, everybody was educated. So everybody who was elite was educated in independence. The bishops primarily in Mexico were primarily very pro-Spain because, because of they had been sort of what had developed was basically where Spain appointed the bishops. And so the bishops were very pro-Spain for the most part. And so when it comes to time, they're going to be very much against the revolution. But a lot of the clergy, as you just said, were, were in a different position. And they, had been, they, had, they were responding to local issues, especially if they were from local areas. 
I would imagine that Mount. I would imagine that many of the the bishops were themselves peninsulares, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Some, uh, several. Yeah. And this this was also also true in other places of of Latin America during the wars of independence, um, where there was a, a break or a, a breach between the local local clergy in many places and the higher um, the higher clergy, the higher the bishops and archbishops and such. And it it would it would be a mistake to ever think about the Mexican wars for independence in general as being a sort of. Mexican Wars for Independence were a messy civil war in and of themselves, right. right? It was the a liberal 18, the liberal Spanish Constitution of 1810 that really triggered, in, in some ways, the 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 the, uh, the independence movement, which was in many ways a, a conservative movement. That's right. That's right. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Control, um, so. Uh, Austin's what? He's from Middletown, Connecticut, or someplace like that. Well, he he was actually born in Western Virginia and grew up in what is now Missouri. His father was a Connecticut Yankee, though. Connecticut. His father was Connecticut. What was their religious affiliations, and what kind of, you know, what kind of aesthetic did he come from? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, the, the 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 Austin family was traced their roots all the way back to the. Or, to the beginning of Massachusetts Bay Colony, so they're they're 1830s Puritans, okay. But uh, it's uh, Austin was raised. Austin himself, if you want to talk about sort of Enlightenment influences, Austin was sort of raised as a child of the Enlightenment, and uh, the the family was not particularly religious. And one of the telling things was in the early days of of colonization, of of, of, te of his Texas venture, he writes home to his in the 1820s. He writes home to his mother in Missouri, and says, "Mom, was I ever baptized? And if so, in what church?" So. You know, they were probably nominally Anglicans, but we don't really know, and he didn't even really know. So he did not bring a he did not bring a particularly strong religious set of principles with him to Texas. Okay, and then the two of you, San Antonio has always been a very sanctuary city. It's embraced people who have fled conflict. The irony of the the colonization from the Anglo settlers. The push across from Louisiana, the remnants of the 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 uh, Aaron Burr idea of an empire creating one in Louisiana and Texas in 1805. All of those people, these people that came into San Antonio were not refugees. They were not immigrants fleeing from hardship, uh, which is a very very different reality than what we San Antonio's heart is at, where we are an embracing city. So it. Do you think there was a conflict at any point between the San Antonio residents dealing with very aggressive entrepreneur settlers? Well, again, I, I think always the, the first thing I, I say when I'm asked a question like that is to uh, point I tried to make in, in my talk was most Anglos and most Tejanos don't have much interaction with one another because the, the centers of Anglo settlement are 50 to 100 miles west of or, or more from, from San Antonio and Goliad. Um, so we're really – until 1836, we're really only talking about – San Antonio is a, is, a, is, a Mexican, is a Mexican town with a few – a few, a, a few odd Anglo's who have moved there for whatever reason, the, the Jim Bowie's of the world and, and some others, right? Um, and as is often the case with, with immigrants moving into, into a, a new area where, where they are the, the, the vast minority, um, and again, kind of using Bowie as an example, he he marries into a pre uh, into a prominent Tejano family. Um, I think Bowie converts. To, uh, I think he converts he, to Catholicism. He does. Uh, and 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 if you didn't convert to Catholicism, you kept your you kept your your uh, thoughts to yourself. Uh, if you were these Anglo's in San Antonio, now in Austin's colony, of course these these people were supposed to be Catholics from Louisiana. That was that was the the language of Austin's first impresario contract most of only some of them were from louisiana and almost none of them were catholics 
Some of them stopped at the border and got baptized by a priest on the Louisiana side before coming on over. We don't know the numbers. I'm guessing my, my, my impression has been that was only a few of them that even did, even bothered with that. But Austin had to really ride herd on them because once in a while a, a Methodist preacher would kind of slide into the colony and start and start holding unauthorized religious services, and Austin had to put the Put, put his hammer down on them a bunch of times, and 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 had had to have them either, either a quiet under reach a quiet understanding with them. You want to meet quietly in someone's private home and have religion have Protestant religious service. You go ahead, but if you ever get out in public, you're you're done. And there were some celebrated cases where Austin had to come down hard on, and even expel from the, the colony, um, uh, Methodist circuit stepped beyond their bounds. I often read through the every every April or Express News comes out with about a 12 page uh, special a supplement where they show the, the royal garbs. And I can swear six out of the 24 usually say that they're a descendant of the Canary Islanders. And I, I, I really would like to see some research done on where did these upper crust of San Antonio interact with Canary Islanders. And again, my, my, my interest is in marrying the daughters and the lands and the land grants and the titles being part of the dowry or the inheritance. But do you all know a good place where I could find that? Well, you mean for the contemporary? What? I want to figure out. I would love to see that family tree. Well, that's, that's called genealogy. I know. And but... uh, you, have to, you have to get everybody in. The, the idea of being Canary Islander is an idea that emerges in the 18th century um, uh, and, and sort of dominates because, as, because as, as we know, the Canary Islanders arrived, they received the lands, they received the positions, they, they ran the, uh, uh, the Cabildo at first. Um, so, and, and so they had a special status, a special position from the very t moment they arrived. So as they married into the into the Mexican uh, population, the, the the military population, it was it, it was beneficial for the Mexican population to take on that identity. Request land from the Cabildo, they would say, and we are from a and we are from the original settlers, the Canary Islanders, and that was uh, to, to tell them that they were they had position and status and that they should get the land. And so it was very beneficial for everybody then to identify as a Canary Islander. And so that tradition continued into the 19th century. Um, and, um, and in some of the memoirs that I mentioned in my talk, you will, you, you, there's references to the fact that and these are, they're writing in the 1870s, uh, and they, they talk about themselves as being Canary Islanders. Well, they're as much Mexicans as they are Canary Islanders because there weren't that... So it's just a status symbol that, that, that develops. The other piece is that um, as the elites uh, become more engaged with the Anglo-Americans, uh, they, they realize that Anglo-Americans would respect them more if they could identify, Anglo-Americans would respect them more if they could identify with being Spanish, um, synonymous with being a Spaniard. Um, and, uh, and so it was beneficial again for the elites to identify in that way. So, um, so uh, my guess is that as into the 20th century, uh, that tradition continued, and, and as, as Anglos and Mexicans married, uh, Anglos uh, learned that one of, their, one of their relatives was Canary Islanders, and they wanted to be of the first settlers as well. Um, so it, it's 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 something that happens. It's like the daughters of the of the American first Revolution. families of Virginia. Same thing. <laughs> there's a, there's a status associated with it, and I think that that. Uh, but to really get down to the quote truth of it, you'd have to do the genealogy. Okay, we're going to move real quickly here. I want to ask each of y'all in five words only. To uh, this is a great question. What was the most at the Bear County locals? supported the revolution in 1836. Five words. Why did the locals side with it? Not all locals did. Not all, not all, not all locals did. Four words. Okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
seemed like the smart thing to do. <laughs> yeah, um, economics, for, for those who did, economics, and um, once again, local interest. Local interest, okay. Here's another question we got. Uh, one of the speakers spoke that people remained neighbors. Uh, and what did that really mean uh, for the, for the, I, I, okay, they remained neighbors was a quote that, that I was given, but it says, but the Tejano and native land was taken away by the colonizers. Please discuss discomfort versus neighborhood. Well, I think that was, I think that was quoting me and, and, and I want to make really sure that, that, that I'm clear of this. I was talking about. I, I was I was talking about pre eighteen thirty five Texas, okay, and 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 this raises I think a really important point. And when I said neighbors, I didn't mean it literally like next door yeah. neighbors. I mean I mean there are Anglo settlements here, there are Tejano settlements here, so they are they are na they are neighbors more than they are inter intermixed, okay. But but the important point I think here is that is that it's important to avoid reading history backwards, okay? It's important that we understand, because we know how the story ends, okay? with, with, with Tejano, Anglo-American sort of relations. We, we know how the story ends, and it's not usually a very pretty picture, certainly not in the, in the decades after the, after the Alamo, after 1836. And it's a story in in many many cases of of, of discrimination and persecution and land disposition. Project that back to the 1820s and the coming of the Anglo's and and into the early 1830s, when as I as I tried to make the argument, Texas is more. It, this, there are conflicts always. There are misunderstandings, but, but but we can look at Texas as a sort of frontier of inclusion. Uh, in in that moment, in that short moment. Okay, and here's another question. Very quickly, what do you think the citizens of San Antonio were doing, doing during the actual battle? Were they hiding, watching like at Gettysburg, left town? Uh, what, what, what do you think the average San Antonio person was doing that day? I, I'll give it a shot. I, I think uh, going back... That is, um, and that was the point I was trying to make, uh, that they, they remembered what happened in 1811, 1813, when forces from the outside, both from the South and from the Rays initially, or originally, right? Um, and that they paid, they paid a high price for that, ultimately. Um, and I think that that might have been on their minds. Those are stories that were told over and over. So when they learned that you have people coming from the east and you have people coming from the south and they were going to fight in your town, uh, you had some who chose to join one side or the other. But I would, I would guess that most people uh, either hunkered down or they left and went to their, to their ranchos. Right. Those, uh, those who had a rancho to go to, right. I think most of them went. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just add that. Right after the revolution, San Patricio and, and Refugio and Goliad were all emptied. Yeah. They were practically deserted. Because yeah. people fled, they hit or they fled if they could. I mean, th what what Arredondo did in 1813, he's, he, after after crushing the revolt in San Antonio, he marched all the way to, all the way to Nacogdoches and conducted a reign of terror, sort of ethnic cleansing operation, and killed hundreds and hundreds of of, of anyone he suspected. Of having been a collaborator with the with the Republican rebels, were were were, were rounded up and shot, you know, and so these you're right, Jerry. These people remembered that vividly, and they wanted to avoid it. Uh, thanks to the work of the scholars, we've we've already amassed a lot of new information that was considered heretical uh, to Texas history in the last 30 years, and it's been the it's been a a pleasure to, to hear your opinions and all of the scholars and, and writers and academicians that have contributed to these wonderful pack uh, these history packets that we've experienced.
However, I have also an honor and call out what I call the citizen historians and researchers who, without academic training or the discipline, provide you guys with letters and stories and anecdotes that have made you know, this history possible. And I want to call out one person who's no longer with us, John De Leon. I don't know if you ever knew him, local historian. Uh, he worked on index cards and would go out and find things in Austin and in old letters and stuff. He just kept everything in index cards. And one of the things he told me before he passed is that he had been reading, going through the, uh, the Antonio Navarro papers. And the, one of the letters he found was from the command, a commanding general in San Antonio from the, um, from the Mexican or from the Spanish army in reply to his complaint that a young Mexican officer named Antonio Santana had raped his daughter. And I was dying. I wanted to find where John's uh, uh, index cards are. And when he passed, you know, at the, at the wake, we said, where is, where's this stuff? What happened? He said the landlord threw him away. But anyway, there's a letter out there that shows the antipathy between Navarro towards Santana that goes all the way back to the Arredondo occupation. Yeah, and I, I'd like to also uh, say that um, it, over the years, it's a lot of local organizations like the Canary Islands Association, like the Bejareños, uh, that have spent years and years doing the kind of the genealogical work uh, that that we historians can 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 look to. Um, so um, it's really amazing how many uh, people in San Antonio have have take have sort of grabbed onto this history and have made their contributions in a, in a big, big, and important way. And for those of you who don't know, Saturday in Lemming, Texas, there's the, uh, the big conference on the Battle of Medina. Uh, it's going to be taking place uh, Friday night, uh, where they're going to set up the tours for the morning with the electric magnetic devices. And then all day Saturday, there'll be conferences and panel discussions, mostly homemade, citizen historians are going to be coming to this. So, Francisco, I hope I hit it within 30 seconds. And thank you all very much. Thank you, panelists. You've been wonderful. Thank you so much, George. Uh, so one final thanks to Dr. Uh, Dr. Greg Cantrell and Father Bob Wright uh, for your and spirit this evening. So to everyone uh, joining us from home, Thank you so much for your commitment and interest to our shared story, uh, all of the stories of the Alamo, and have a very good night.